Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is George Selgin. George is the director of the Cato's Institute for Monetary and Financial Alternatives and is a former professor of economics at the University of Georgia. He is widely published in monetary and banking theory, monetary history, and macroeconomics. George is also my former professor and is the individual who first introduced me to monetary economics. Of course, he is not responsible for the views I've taken since graduate school, but he has been highly influential in my thinking. George, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. It's nice to be here. Oh, it's always good to have my former instructor back, just like the good old days of monetary economics with George Selgin. I'll try not to give you such a hard time. Oh, I appreciate that. Let's begin by talking about an idea you've developed, and that is the productivity norm. Can you tell us what it is and what it implies for monetary policy? Sure, David. The uh, productivity norm, the, the, the name is somewhat misleading. It actually it, it refers to a norm for how the price level ought to behave. And what it means is that contrary to the very conventional and, and still very popular view that uh, ideally the price level or at least the inflation rate ought to be as stable as possible, a constant, whether it's 2% or some other number, zero used to be the favorite. Uh, contrary to that, under a productivity norm, the rate of inflation is allowed to reflect the economy's underlying rate of productivity growth, uh, uh, specifically by adjusting opposite with adjustments to the rate of productivity growth. So in a more uh, rapidly growing economy where productivity is growing more than usual, you would uh, allow a, a lower inflation rate and in some proposals like my own original one, even a, a modest rate of deflation to reflect the fact that the economy is getting more productive. And uh, that's another way of saying to reflect the fact that the uh, average uh, cost of production, unit cost of production of, of many goods uh, and of goods in general is is falling. So if goods get cheaper, prices should generally fall. Uh, conversely, if you have an adverse supply shock, the rate of inflation should be allowed to go up. And the <clears throat> the reason for advocating this norm is that uh, I believe if inflation is kept constant despite fluctuations in productivity growth, that itself can be a source of trouble. The productivity norm has a link to proposals for, for market monetarists and that they all involve treating stability of nominal spending rather than of the price level is what's really desirable for overall macroeconomic stability. Okay. Many economists would agree with your point that if there's a negative supply shock, so there's a sudden reduction in the supply of oil, some natural disaster, that prices should temporarily be allowed to go up because you wouldn't want to tighten policy in a situation like that. But they have a hard time with the flip side of that argument, right? That there's a, if there's right. a positive supply shock, then maybe some you know disinflation, maybe even mild deflation should be allowed. Why is there this asymmetry in, in probably most economists' thinking? I think economists are spooked by uh, deflation generally. Uh, and that spooking seems to have mainly come about in the, as a result of what happened in the 1930s. And uh, it's important to acknowledge, because some people don't, that yes, deflation can be very spooky. But uh, it's spooky when it is a consequence of uh, a collapse of spending in the economy or in GDP or whatever metric you want to uh, mm -hmm. use to measure spending. Uh, in that case, of course, when spending collapses, it's impossible for the average firm to recoup its historical uh, uh, expenditures and to make profit. So we have the average firm losing money, which is not uh, a good thing because it's not a useful signal to the economy. It just signals that there's a shortage of money in the economy. Uh, and that's what happened in the 30s, and, uh, and both at the beginning of the decade and later on in 36, 37, and 8. Uh, so we do have – there is such a thing as bad deflation. Uh, however, there is also such a thing as good deflation, which is the 
kind of deflation you were just referring to, which is the flip side of adverse productivity shocks or supply shock, where you have a positive productivity shocks. Actually, people are perfectly happy to tolerate good deflation if it's uh, uh, limited to a few goods. Uh, but what that means in practice is they're only willing to tolerate it if some other goods are getting more expensive so that the price index or inflation rate measured with mm -hmm. the conventional price index is not changing. So uh, it's okay for the price of computers to fall, but but by gosh, something else had better go up to, to keep the overall price mm -hmm. index or the inflation rate from changing. Well, the reality is, more often than not, productivity improvements are happening in many sectors of the economy at once, affecting many goods at once, with improvements outweighing or outnumbering uh, situations where unit costs of production are rising. In that case, well, <laughs> why not let the general rate of inflation and the general price level uh, reflect the overall state of changing state of productivity? But again, because they've been spooked by the 30s and other, some other episodes, economists are very reluctant. They, they tend to speak of deflation as if it was always demand-driven. Ben Bernanke routinely does that. He seems to be un incapable of recognizing this other kind. Uh, he does once in a while very grudgingly. In fact, if I may add, <clears throat> uh, now there have been quite a few studies of historical deflation. Uh, Kehoe and Atkinson, uh, Borio uh, and others, Claudio Borio. And uh, they all come to the same conclusion that, uh, in fact, the good sort of deflation I was just describing has historically been uh, more common than the other sort. Therefore, uh, uh, we have pl more examples of that kind of deflation, the sort that there's really no reason to, for the authorities to prevent, uh, than we have of the bad kind. Of course, we have to be wary of the latter. We certainly don't want to uh, uh, risk allowing it when it shouldn't, when, when we don't want to. But that, that uh, alertness should not be uh, allowed to translate into an absolute refusal to allow prices uh, generally to ever fall, even when that means you've got to contract, nom uh, 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 sorry, you've got to artificially expand nominal spending to, to prevent that fall. Well, let's give a concrete example of this benign deflation. So the post-bellum deflation period, so right after the Civil War up until about 1896, before they had the big gold discoveries, was a period in, in U.S. history where we saw, on average, rapid economic growth, as well as a c consistent one to two percent deflation a year. Yet, you know, the world didn't end. Um, can you speak to that experience and what it says about benign deflation? Sure. Yeah, I will. Uh, I think it's a very important experience, and uh, it has been widely misunderstood. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, deflation of the sort you describe was roughly occurring not only in the United States, but in, in all of the gold standard okay. countries at the time. So it was a phenomenon that, that was linked to, to the gold standard and obviously was due to the fact that the gold standard was allowing for, in general, mm -hmm. just enough money growth to offset extensive expansion in production, but roughly not enough to meet uh, the expansion in production that, that was related to productivity improvements. I say roughly because we, we should not uh, uh, pretend that the, the gold standard exactly got the productivity norm right. It certainly didn't. Uh, but it came pretty close. Now, a lot of people have, based on U.S. experience, said, oh, you know, this was terrible. We had all these uh, crashes, etc. Some even have treated the, the whole period from the 1870s to the 1890s as one big slump because prices were falling as if deflation were identical to depression, which is certainly not true. Uh, as a matter of fact, of course, the U.S. had uh, many severe downturns, mostly linked to financial crises. These were a peculiar result of uh, problems with the U.S. banking system that weren't repeated in the other gold standard nations. And during those episodes, we tended to have some bad 
deflation right, right. mixed in with the good. Uh, and that has also been a source of confusion. But as for the general background secular deflation, yeah. there's no link uh, so, in the U.S. any more than in any of the other countries between that and uh, a general uh, 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 any any general slump. We know that people were not unemployed generally at high rates. We know right. that people right. didn't feel depressed for most of these periods. Only during those financial crises and for some time mm -hmm. after did you really have a slump. And so people confuse those crises, 1873, 1893. They're really sharp, but as you said, they were tied to this this faulty national banking system, That's which right. was very conducive to financial crisis. And I think it, what a good counterexample is is the panic in 1907. So if you go 1907, you actually you go to an inflationary regime. So. Indeed. And the panic in 1907 was the worst financial crisis of that postbellum period. So it speaks to the fact that the financial crisis wasn't a product or a function of the deflation. It was a function of the system because it occurred in an inflationary environment as well as the deflationary environment. That's absolutely right. In fact, there's all kinds of evidence you could, you could bring to bear on this point because you could look at different countries. You could look at Canada. Canada had the same gold dollar. They had the same deflation, secular deflation. They didn't have the crises, though, because they had a different monetary and banking system without a central bank, for what that's worth. And uh, 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 and so if they had all those elements in common, it can't have been one of these elements that had in common, they had in common with the United States that was responsible for those crises that did occur. It had to be something peculiar to the United States. Uh, and uh, and and uh, and indeed, after the uh, Klondike and other discoveries, South African, especially uh, of the 1890s, uh, the deflationary trend ended. It was replaced by an inflationary trend, but this change had essentially no bearing on the incidence of crises in the U.S. or anywhere else. Okay, and and one thing I think we probably need to stress is, and this is a question that I often encounter is, well, how would the central bank know when it's good deflation or bad deflation? And and the productivity norm, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have to worry about that. It would take care of itself. Yeah. All you have to do yeah. is focus on stabilizing demand. Is that right? That's exactly right. In fact, it's a, it's a widespread um, <clears throat> misconception, by which I mean widespread, um, widespread among the relatively small number of people who have ever heard of a productivity norm, that, um, that it calls upon the central bank assuming that you have a central bank, to take account of productivity changes and react appropriately to them. But that's exactly wrong. That's exactly the opposite of the truth. It's when the central bank is determined to maintain a constant inflation rate that, in principle, it has to try to anticipate productivity changes because those changes will affect the rate of inflation unless it takes a counter monetary policy actions. So every central bank that's determined to keep a, a stable price level target, say the ECB trying to keep 2%, uh, is, is, is obliged to inform itself uh, and for, to try to forecast productivity innovations in order to offset them. Under a productivity norm, those innovations are among the things the central banks should not pay any attention to and should not respond to. So it's a one piece of information less that they need to anticipate. Uh, uh, and indeed, when you look at the factors that determine output, right, because a stable price level, let's just speak of stable price level, uh, people can make adapt, adapt what I'm saying for the case sure. of a stable rate of inflation. Uh, what it really calls for in the famous formulation is having the, the amount of money that's chasing goods only adjust as the total amount of goods adjusts, which means you're anticipating changes in total output and trying to have a money supply uh, expansion, uh, allowing for changes in velocity to keep up with, with that. Well, the component of output change that's hard to predict is the productivity component. All the others are relatively stable, the population or labor force growth uh, uh, um, and uh, the growth of the capital stock uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but intensive changes in productivity, total factor productivity, those are the ones that are the most difficult to forecast. And if central banks are going to make mistakes in attempting to keep prices stable, they're going to make mistakes with respect to their forecasts of total factor productivity growth. The productivity norm says, don't bother. You don't need to offset those. 
and therefore you don't need to take the risk of, of doing it incorrectly. Yeah, so some people might wonder, well, then do we have a nominal anchor? But the answer is yes. We're still tied to a nominal measure, and in the long run, that anchors down prices, trend, trend prices. But in the short run, there can be deviations. So maybe, maybe I should step back in a minute. So the Fed would, if it were the Fed doing a productivity norm, it would keep spending growing at a stable growth path or growth, growth rate. And the question would be how that growth rate was broken down into real growth versus changes in prices. One year, it might be higher real growth, lower prices. The next year, it might be the opposite. Is that, is that fair? That's right. And a lot of people are hung up on that because they say, well, uh, you know, this would mean that uh, if you're stabilizing nominal spending, this means you're allowing output and the price level to, to, to vary more than they would if you were perhaps mm -hmm. weighing, uh, trying to stabilize some weighted average, as in a Taylor rule, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, but that misses the point because the, but the goal of, of, of a monetary policy, in my opinion, and in, in in that of market monetarists, I take it, is not to aim for any uh, absolute stability of either P or Y, but rather... Uh, to, cons to, to avoid monetary influences on Y, deviations from the natural rate, we might say. Uh, and that's a question of stabilizing demand, which is to say total spending. You can think of uh, the amount of NGDP is just, just indicating the position of the aggregate demand schedule and aggregate supply demand space. And in that case, if the, to the extent that the natural rate is, is changing, and shifting, particularly with, with in response to productivity gains and losses, well then, that should be reflected uh, in changes in the uh, uh, price level or inflation rate. I make an analogy, uh, or rather respond to uh, um, uh, 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 um, uh, an analogy in talking about this, where some people say, well, having a price level that, that varies is like having a a thermometer that uh, you know isn't measuring the temperature mm -hmm. correctly, and or uh, uh, or a yardstick made of rubber and so on, but it's not correct. Under a productivity norm, it's true the price level varies, but it's also true that in the world the temperature varies. So the thermometer registers different temperatures. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, when uh, and and similarly, let's say we have a ruler and we're me measuring the average height of people. Sometimes the average height of the entire population changes, and we wouldn't want to m change our ruler so that average is always constant. Uh, you know, five feet in the Victorian era, or whatever, right? And so it mm -hmm. must be five feet today. Similarly, when when the price level changes under productivity uh, norm, it's, it's not telling you that you've got a broken yardstick or rubber one or bad thermometer. It's telling you that the goods are getting cheaper to produce or getting more expensive to produce. Very useful, informative signal. And then there's another side of the argument, which is, <clears throat> remember when we're, we're stabilizing output prices, or rather we're allowing output prices to change under a productivity norm, what we're stabilizing is an index of factor prices in principle. Uh, conversely, those who would stabilize output prices in the face of productivity innovations are destabilizing factor prices. They think that they're stabilizing the price level and, and, and imagining that this is uh, uh, all prices, or, right? Uh, but they're forgetting that the, what, what, what price level stabilization or inflation targeting imply, uh, involve in practice is looking at one set of prices and not looking at the other. You can make all kinds of good arguments and economists through the ages have made them that it's more important that factor prices be kept stable than, than, than final goods prices. Yeah, this speaks to a, a criticism that I often hear, or at least recently I've heard, and that is with the nominal GDP target. And that's what the productivity norm is, to be very clear. It's, it's a special kind of nominal GDP target. One of the earliest time. One of the earliest. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> but it's, it's basically a nominal GDP target. And I believe Mervyn Keene had a paper, made this point, that, you know, well, if we have a nominal GDP target every so often, we have to go out and estimate potential GDP and adjust the target. And that kind of defeats the whole purpose of a nominal target, right? And the whole point of that. And, and along those lines, can you also speak to, to this idea that when we're measuring, you know, the effect of monetary policy or the stance of it, there's this, this idea that you've got to decompose, you know, nominal measures into the real and inflation as opposed to measuring the actual observed nominal measure? 
Okay, so on this question of what the central bank has to do, let's re- 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 let's remember that uh, if you have a central bank targeting the inflation rate, what that means is that uh, setting fluctuations in velocity aside, which all of these norms you have to, the central bank would have to offset changes in velocity. So yes, let's set that yes. aside. Uh, then under a, an inflation targeting regime, what the central bank has to do is try to try to forecast uh, and certainly to be aware of current changes in total output, right? That's little y in the equations. Uh, that means that it has to know about both intensive and extensive changes in output, where extensive changes are changes based on increased factor input. Intensive are based on uh, uh, changes, uh, increased uh, factor productivity, right? As I said earlier, it's the factor productivity that's the hard one to anticipate. It bounces around a lot as we, as we mm-hmm. know from recent experience. We know that very well. Uh, the other one, the factor input, eh, it's not no, it doesn't change that much. You, it's relatively easy to forecast that. So if you're a baseline central banker trying to uh, make sure you hit a fixed inflation rate target, you've got a, a big forecasting challenge. If you're just trying to, to anticipate uh, to fix an NGDP growth target, you have a considerably easier challenge right, because right. you're only having to anticipate that input factor. But uh, the, the, that is relatively less volatile and easier to guesstimate. They'll get it wrong, but right, they're not as right. likely to get it wrong as the other component. Maybe another way of saying that is that if you're an inflation targeting central bank like most are, they have to divine what's causing the changes in inflation to get it right. If it's a velocity change or demand change, they need to respond to that. But if there's supply changes, productivity driven changes, they need to ignore those. Well, under my regime, they need to ignore the productivity changes, but that the point is that's just a matter of not bothering to forecast right. no, it's, those. It's, it's far the easier. The problem is that under the uh, pr- uh, inflation targeting regime, they need to forecast future productivity as well as future factor input in order to make sure that n- changes in neither of those things mm-hmm. result in changes in the rate of inflation uh, uh, because they have anticipated and offset them with monetary uh, uh, policy, and they've adjusted their monetary targets uh, acc- yeah. uh, accordingly. Whereas with the productivity norm, you don't you don't worry about factor input. You do worry about you know if, if, if lots of people immigrate and your labor force changes. Uh, you don't want to not accommodate that. Simple way to think of that is that that would put downward pressure on uh, factor prices, specifically wage rates, and so you want to have some monetary accommodation to avoid it. But you wouldn't worry about the fact that prices fall you, because of productivity gains, right? You, right. You, you would just let them, and you wouldn't anticipate them. The fact that you didn't forecast productivity, meant it, it wouldn't concern you, you wouldn't try, the price level would change, you know, you would only have to worry about your mistakes in forecasting factor input. Right. So your job would be a lot easier. Yeah. A whole lot easier. A lot easier. Yeah. Yes. What about the history of thought on that? So you you resurrected this idea, and I think you've done some research pointing out that this actually was a fairly common idea pre-1930s. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, people in those days didn't speak about NGDP targeting or anything mm-hmm. close, nor did they use the expression productivity norm. Uh, but uh, until the 1930s, there were more economists who uh, 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 subscribed to some ideal involving a stability of spending, MV or P times Y, then uh, who uh, advocated a stability of the general price level. Now, mind you, most of these discussions uh, were in the context of gold standards and that sort of thing, and probably more uh, more than any other position, the most popular was that favoring retention of one of these standards as, as approximating some such ideal uh, better than other institutional arrangements could. Uh, economists back then, I think, were less naive than they are today about hmm. uh, how uh, central planners could implement their ideal theory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every economist seems to talk the, about, most economists talk about central banks today as if they were running them in they would do exactly what their theory says is right. And in fact, of course, the central banks disappoint all of them. Anyway, um, uh, 
So before Keynes came along, you had quite a few economists, uh, including many famous ones from different schools, uh, offhand Dennis Roberts and uh, Alan Fisher in New Zealand, uh, John Williams at Harvard, uh, Frederick Hayek, uh, Koopmans, uh, Dutch economist, uh, Myrdal. Uh, uh, Vixel was an exception. Vixel, we all know, thought that keeping interest rates at their natural levels was the same as, as keeping a stable price level. People didn't speak of inflation targeting back then. If they advocated a stable inflation rate, it tended to be a zero rate. Uh, but there was a big debate between uh, Vixel and uh, uh, other Swedes, uh, notably a fellow named David Davidson, about this. We could trace this back much further than these neoclassicals I've been talking about to persons who spoke of a labor theory of value, for example, in the uh, early 19th century. A, uh, sorry, a labor standard of value, pardon me, which is quite a different thing from Marx's and others' okay. labor theory of value. What they meant was that uh, their ideal, their conception of an ideal standard would mm -hmm. stabilize the price of labor, which is, of course, closer, is a kind of productivity norm. Uh, so it's an old idea. And uh, very interestingly, as I've written in uh, an article for History of Political Economy, Keynes himself comes very close to conceding the merits of a predictivity norm in the general theory, or at least the merits of a, of a monetary policy uh, that would stabilize not output prices, but wages or nominal, nominal wages. And uh, then he, he waff, waffles, he's back and forth in the general theory, back and forth, and finally ends up uh, embracing a stable price level norm. And by the way, yes, I just said that Keynes favored a stable price level norm. He does in the general theory. It's just that in that book, uh, he's assuming pretty much throughout that uh, the economy is in a state where the actual uh, equilibrium price level is before, below <laughs> the actual uh, the equilibrium price levels is below the actual price level and in that situation of course uh, any kind of monetary expansion doesn't mm -hmm. raise the price level it just gets you back towards that price level once again being in equilibrium so the productivity norm is an, actually an old idea you've resurrected it you've, you've published on it and uh, I was exposed to it um I've been. I've talked to Ramesh Panuru, who's the writer for National Review, and he was influenced by your work on productivity norms as well, which also led him into nominal GDP targeting. So you, your work on that has has been influential. I want to think of a new application for it, and I want you to hear me out and, and tell me if this this makes any sense. But you know, today there are many who argue that you know technology is rapidly taking off. There's increased you know, a digitization of society, more networking, more smart machines, 3D printers, driverless cars. And some are concerned this is going to accelerate, all right? We're going to have more and more rapid technology growth. And and they're concerned that... Heaven for Finn. Well, right. It's, 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 it'd be a great future. But there's some, you know, particularly on the left, who are concerned that this will be very disruptive in the short run. And this will affect labor more than... Ca capital will benefit more in the short run than labor. And there's, there's, there's concern about massive structural unemployment as such. Yes. Let's take that as, as given, that that's the case. Wouldn't a productivity norm be exactly what we would need in terms of monetary policy for a situation like that? Because labor would, would more directly share in those real economic gains through a lower price level. Their, their nominal wages would be stabilized, but their rapid technological gains would be shared with them via lower prices. Well, uh, yeah, I think logically you can say that. Uh, I suppose you could put it more pithily by saying that if you're out of work, you'd rather be out of work with prices falling than with them right, staying the right. same. Uh, right. <laughs> but of course, this is a little consolation if you're not getting any income at all, uh, which I suppose in the more dire cases might happen. But to be not to be so facetious about it, anybody on fixed income benefits under a productivity norm from productivity gains along with uh, all consumers. Uh, and that includes uh, welfare, social security recipients, and so on, and people mm -hmm. on, presumably people on unemployment. Uh, whereas uh, the, the standard regime that seeks and achieves a stable inflation rate tends to leave the, the, uh, <clears throat> the same people uh, uh, out of luck. 
when it comes to partaking of the productivity improvements that others are are enjoying because they're enjoying them through increased nominal salaries mm-hmm. and earnings. So there's a real serious distribution mm-hmm. implication, and I think you're right. I think that uh, all things considered, a productivity norm tends to be uh, uh, more favorable to uh, to groups that uh, are not particularly at the high high end of the of the food chain than uh, price level stabilization. But I, I I I hesitate to go too far uh, 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 out on the limb on this because, of course, there are many very well to do people who also have live off of fixed incomes. Sure. They tend to be sure. retirees. Uh, but there are some clearly some uh, real distributional implications of having. A productivity norm versus a, a, a stable price level that ought to be taken into account with all the other considerations. Well, I think that approach would, would make someone who is much more, you know, free market friendly, someone who believes in markets over government, um, they, they would embrace that approach compared to some of the other proposals. Should this world come where machines are doing everything and capitalists, and again, this is more of a transition story, but yeah. one, an alternative proposal that's often been discussed is that the government should stop, start buying shares of the S&P 500 yes. and then take that and pay it to, to individuals, which would be a very much a, an interventionist approach, whereas a productivity norm could, could kind of get the same yeah. effect. Well, you know, David, uh, people think that I, uh, I don't know anything about anything except monetary economics and, at the, at the, and, and only ask me questions about that at, at the risk of proving them right. <laughs> I'd like to say something about this argument about technology yeah, because yeah. it's always struck me as something very weird, this idea that technology, technological uh, innovations occur um, in such a way as to result in a tremendous uh, serious mismatch of, 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 of uh, available skills with available technologies. It seems to me that rather that what, what's more likely to occur is that innovations take place in response to uh, 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 the the labor situation that people don't uh, don't just uh, invent machines that nobody can run and put them on the mm-hmm. market. Uh, I mean, apart from training right, and everything. Right. But what I mean is that if you don't have the basic skills out there, where you could at least train people and make these machines work. Uh, conversely, if you do have large pools of unemployed labor. You're, you're, you would you would innovate uh, in a direction would take advantage of that. Let me let me make it a more simple example. Suppose suppose that somebody came up with a way to uh, um, uh, an improved machinery that that relied on using some very rare element that wasn't available. Well, that just won't fly because it's too expensive to come up with that element. But if a lot of that stuff suddenly became available, somebody finds a vast new source of some Mm -hmm. rare uh, uh, commodity or uh, mineral, uh, technology would respond. Technology is doing these things all the time. But when people come to talk about labor shortages and skills, it's as if the technology just, you know, fell from from the sky willy nilly, where the people working on it didn't didn't give a thought to what the actual available resources were. Sure. And this doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so I'm not. Uh, I'm speaking well, no, outside I, of. I understand. I'm speaking outside of my expertise, but. Still, I think somebody needs to consider then when people are doing all this R&D and coming up with these innovations, they're not simply trying to replace labor. They're trying to replace cheaper met- costly methods mm-hmm. of production with cheaper methods of production yeah. uh, 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 in a way that's informed by the actual scarcity of these of the different resources right. in the economy. So uh, at least people should try to argue as if they were aware of this tendency. No, I, I understand. Um, let's <clears throat> let's talk about the implications of the productivity norm, not necessarily just the rule itself, but the idea that there can be benign deflation as well as malign deflation. Um, and, and let's apply it to the housing boom period. Let's talk about that period. There was a big productivity surge right after 2001, um, rapid gains in total factor productivity. If you go back and read newspaper accounts, there's just all this discussion going on at that time. And it really threw a curveball for the Federal Reserve. Um, can you explain how it did that and, and why this may have been a reason the Fed blew it, according to some, during the housing boom period? So uh, 
Um, as I mentioned before, productivity is hard to forecast. It's also hard to measure. So uh, uh, that's another reason why you shouldn't try if you uh -huh. don't have to. Uh, and policies that don't require it are better than policies that do. Uh, but but having said that, uh, you're right. Most most estimates of uh, total factor productivity had a growing very rapidly after the 2001 dot com crash, which might, by the way, involved a setback to uh, or uh, an interruption of what had been a, a similar productivity boom uh, before the dot com okay. uh, phenomenon, and that in fact. A, a boom that probably contributed to the dot com boom. It's, it was was underlying the dot com boom itself. So uh, then you had a crash. The Federal Reserve uh, was aware of this rapid uh, productivity growth, but because they were committed to uh, an ideal of stable inflation, they perceived it as supplying a grounds for uh, mon easing, uh, keeping mon money easy uh, uh, and, or, or easing it. And, uh, uh, and because otherwise there would be a tendency for the inflation rate to drop below target. And uh, it's interesting that some of the economists uh, or some of the FOMC members involved, who are, including some who were economists, uh, openly acknowledged that uh, this probably means, you know, going – uh, in a sense, uh, setting rates below their proper equilibrium values. And here I think they were to some extent thinking in Fixellian terms. Uh, but that this was okay because it is not going to result in inflationary pressure, right? So the idea is, ah, look, productivity is growing really rapidly. We can we can ease monetary policy and we can keep interest rates lower or even lower them depending on which time in this period we're talking about and it won't have inflationary consequences and isn't that great because that allows us to do more to help the economy get back on its feet after this uh, crash. So uh, productivity gains instead of being treated as a reason to modify the inflation target are treated as a, uh, an opportunity to uh, 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 ease monetary policy or keep it easy uh, without having to face the consequences of, of, uh, of uh, higher headline inflation. I think this was a big mistake uh, because, uh, uh, in fact, it in involved uh, overly easy policy according to a productivity norm standard or an GDP growth mm -hmm. standard. Now, the NGDP growth rates weren't phenomenally high, but they were higher than usual. There's a couple percentage points higher depending on what long-run trend you, you look at. Um, now, it would be a bad mistake, of course, to, to say that because of this, you had this terrible subprime boom and consequent bust. Mm. And I don't think anybody thinks that. What I think people think think, <laughs> who believe that monetary policy was too easy at this time. And what I think is that in combination with many other circumstances, uh, 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 regulations, policies, what have you, and some private market developments too, of course, uh, the excess credit that was being created here as the counterpart of uh, easier mm -hmm. money. Uh, was all tended to be shunted into the mortgage market and the subprime mortgage market especially. So we had a perfect storm of conditions w in which one element of that perfect storm was excessively easy monetary policy. And what was informing that excessively easy monetary policy was the view that when productivity grows more rapidly, that's not only a license for, but an invitation to uh, 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 ease monetary, uh, have an easier monetary policy. So the Fed in the early to mid-2000s, they eased um, beyond what they should have because mm -hmm. they saw low inflation. Now, th is the story that they, they took advantage of the low inflation and said, hey, we can ease um, is it that is that the story, or did they simply misread the inflation? So, no, I, I think they they correctly read the productivity figures. So they knew the inflation was low because of productivity. No, they knew it would be low. Would be that low. Is, okay. They knew it would be lower than usual for any given monetary policy stance, and therefore they took this as an opportunity to have an easier monetary policy stance. Okay. Uh, saying to themselves and to each other, well, we, we, we have some softening, you know, we have some downward pressure 
uh -huh. on prices coming so we can put more upward pressure on them to offset it. Uh, upward pressure on prices from easy monetary mm -hmm. policy. So they're, they're, in that sense, they're treating the anticipation of uh, continued rapid productivity growth as, as allowing them to set an easier uh, monetary policy uh, target okay. than they would have otherwise. And this is what was informing the decision, first of all, to lower the target all mm -hmm. the way to 1%, but more importantly, to hold it there for as long as it was held okay. there. Because one of the challenges that we referred to earlier is that when you're doing inflation targeting in real time, it's sometimes hard to know why inflation changes. So if it's a supply shock or demand shock, but what you're saying in this period is they did know why it was, was going down Indeed. and they just took advantage of it. They, they it, wanted a, a free lunch in monetary policy. The point is uh, they didn't care why it was going down, okay. which is perfectly <laughs> consistent with having an inflation uh -huh. target, right? If you believe a stable inflation rate is what, what you want, I'm, I'm, of course, allowing. I'm, of course, here abstracting from the fact that the Fed's mandate is more complicated than that. Uh -huh. But, uh, but in fact, if you throw in the Fed, actual Fed dual mandate, you have an even more compelling reason why they would treat any opportunity to ease monetary policy during a recovery uh, as one they should take advantage of. And here, what the way they read this was: we have a problem where we have a recovery that's sluggish. We want it to be faster. We are under an obligation to maximize employment and not mm -hmm. blow our inflation, not let inflation get too high. We can do that because we've got a productivity surge, right? But one of the, one of the uh, arguments for flexible inflation targeting is that you know you you don't hit two percent this year or next year. It's over the median term. On average, you hit two percent, which in theory, it gives the central bank some flexibility in, in what inflation is one year to the next. So it gives them the room, room to, you know, respond if there's some kind of shock that hits the economy. And, and so some argue that, hey, if they did flexible inflation targeting right, it'd be very close to a nominal GDP target. They could, they would, they would respond properly by ignoring supply shocks. So if, as an example, late 2008, the Fed saw high inflation and they, 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 they were worried, so they didn't cut rates. They, they misread the inflation tea leaves. The ECB, it actually raised rates in 2008. It raised interest rates twice in 2011 because inflation was going up. But I would argue those were supply shocks they should have ignored. Well, that's right. I mean, look, flexible flexibility is vastly overrated because it's true that uh, flexible inflation targeting could uh, allow for, does allow for, uh, the kinds of response that uh, you and I might like to see to productivity innovations. But it also allows for all kinds of responses right. that have to other things and or responses to productivity innovations different from what we would like to see or opposite them. So, yeah, flexibility sounds great. You know, mm -hmm. and again, if, you, if you're the kind of person who is uh, optimistic that it'll be used the way you think it should be used, and then you always favor flexibility. But this gets us back to the more fundamental thing about central banks and rules versus well, I think discretion. Right? It takes us back to the knowledge problem. It takes I mean, us to the knowledge I mean, problem. It takes us to the very fundamental issue. Most advocates right. of, of monetary discretion, it's rather sad to say, you know, they favor <laughs> it because it, 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 it didn't allows anything to happen. And in this set of <laughs> you know, infinite can be set, justified. Uh, it, that infinite set always includes what the advocate of discretion thinks is ideal. Right. right, right. So that what the advocate of discretion is saying is, if if the central bank could only do every, anything. It, it, it'll do what I would want it to do, right. or, it, uh, or it's assuming that, that that's the most, most likely outcome. Not that the advocates of discretion never assume that the central bank will use the discretion to do something that they think is terrible, uh, whereas the proponents of discretion, of rules, whether it's targeting the price level or inflation rate or a productivity norm rule, if you like, or mm -hmm. a nominal GDP rule, are uh, are assuming there's a high likelihood that if the, if the central bank could do something else, they'd pick something worse. Right. <laughs> it's right. as simple and as I, that. I think <laughs> even now we see this as the Fed heads into 2016. There's uncertainty. Is inflation low because oil prices are low or is it low because the economy is weakening? We just don't know in real time. That's one of the advantages of, of a productivity norm, a nominal GDP rule. Look, all you do is keep it simple. Focus on stabilizing demand and let the other pieces fall where they may. It's, it's not the job of the central banker to play God and try to figure out what 
is happening to the real economy. Let me right. let me move on to um, the Fed's mistakes of 2008, because mm-hmm. I know you've been doing a lot of work on that recently. And, and I've been very critical of the Fed during that time. But you've you've taken a, a couple of interesting pieces on that period. You've and, and, and I've worked through them. You've looked at um, the Fed's sterilization of its bank lending program in 2007 through 2008, as well as the Fed's interest on reserve policies. Could you explain what those are and how they may have contributed to the worsening of the uh, recession in 2008? Okay, so <clears throat> throughout 2008, particularly after the, the, the crisis uh, uh, really started to pick up with the, the Bear Stearns uh, event. Uh, um, the Fed was engaged in all kinds of emergency lending. Right? Uh, they didn't. They didn't call it QE anything yet. Retroactively, they would call some of the expansion, the more massive expansion after the Lehman failure. Retroactively, they would call that QE one. But at the time, they weren't thinking of QE. They were simply rescuing or bailing out various financial uh, firms, etc. And their balance sheet uh, would have grown in the course of these uh, emer- this emergency lending. And eventually it did grow. But, but the Fed was, throughout this period, concerned that the rescues, which it perceived as being aimed solely at, at uh, helping these particular enterprises, uh, would inadvertently uh, result in uh, uh, an easing of general monetary conditions. And they did not want that to happen because they had their idea of where the federal funds rate target should be. And by gosh, they were going to stick hmm. to it. Now, <clears throat> this is all well and good if the target's where it ought to be. But in retrospect, it's pretty clear it was higher than it ought to be. <laughs> that is that some monetary easing really was desirable at this time. And by the way, conventional – Conventional understanding of the rule of a central bank during crisis would would lead one to think that that providing yes. more liquidity would have been the natural thing to do, not just to particular firms, but to the economy in general. Nevertheless, the Fed was determined not to do that. They did this. They prevented it, the in, in general liquidity or monetary conditions from easing at first by sterilizing their emergency loans. This is what they did up to Lehman, uh, 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 and particularly up to when AIG was bailed out, and. That meant that they had a lot of treasuries on their books. When they made, as their lending, emergency lending increased through the various programs or directly, they would sell off treasuries, that is buy back uh, reserves, uh, exactly in an offsetting manner so that their balance sheet and total reserves didn't, didn't change. So the only result is a reallocation of liquidity to the firms being aided through the emergency lending, but it, a reduction in liquidity, equal reduction everywhere else. Okay, so this was sterilized lending, and uh, again, uh, if you don't think there's a general lack of liquidity, if there isn't, if monetary policy is just right. Uh, I guess that's the right thing to do. Except it wasn't just right; it was too tight. Uh, and uh, there's all kinds of evidence in, uh, of this, including most obviously from our point of view, the fact that NGDP growth was had had stopped. And GDP had, uh, had had growth had slowed down, and then eventually would even turn negative for a period. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, there'd be an absolute decline in NGDP, a level decline. And this, of course, uh, by our uh, understanding, is is bound to cause the adverse developments in the financial market to become a, a, Even a, a more general right. c- crisis. Now, um, after Lehman, uh, uh, the Fed's policy didn't change at all. It was determined to keep it. I mean, it, it, made, hesit- it made grudging downward adjustments to its federal funds target, but, but they were grudging in, in the sense that they were both inadequate and frankly meaningless because the the equilibrium federal funds target or the natural target or the effective target any one of those things you want to talk about had already gone down below the the uh, the I mean the equilibrium rates had already fallen below the the target which had become therefore rather meaningless nevertheless um, after Lehman uh, the big bailouts of AIG and subsequent uh, ones that involved even bigger uh, uh, um, loans uh, 
the Fed did not have sufficient treasuries left on its book to, to sterilize. So sterilization became impossible. Incidentally, there was another program that involved issuing special bonds to the treasury and having the treasury park the money uh, and parking the money in uh, uh, issuing Fed bonds and parking the money in these special accounts. So that was also, again, designed to reduce the available effective quantity of total reserves. All of this was contractionary policy because it was felt that emergency lending by itself would be too expansionary. Okay. Once they were no longer able to sterilize to, to offset emergency lending, they, that's when they implemented interest on reserves, that is, positive interest rate on reserves, including excess reserves. And the idea, the express idea, this is not me looking at things after the fact and saying, here's what they were really up to. Mm -hmm. This is what they say they were up to. The express goal was to have another uh, device, an alternative to sterilization that would, again, make sure that the expansion in the Fed's balance sheet, and now it's the whole balance sheet that's growing because they, they aren't sterilizing anymore, uh, that that expansion does not translate into general easing of monetary policy, a general increase in liquidity, and a lowering of the effective or equilibrium federal funds target, as it would if banks took the extra liquidity that was being made available to them through these emergency programs and used it, if some of them used it, uh, to either make loans in the interbank market or to purchase uh, securities. Now, when they purchase securities, that's particularly significant because that, that would generate a, a multiplier effect. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that would mean that the amount of total monetary and credit expansion ultimately based on a given amount of – a given increment of new base money, of new reserves would be that much greater. So, so essentially the Fed has turned to interest on reserves as a way to uh, uh, effectively achieve what sterilization beforehand had achieved and that means this. The sterilization means you don't really increase the total amount of the monetary base as you rescue firms. Interest on reserves allows the monetary base to expand but – the idea is to keep the multiplier down so that you have the same outcome. This was the express purpose of both. And that's why I'm equally critical of both, because I believe that these were the instruments by which the Fed pursued what was, in fact, an overly tight monetary policy when that allowed nominal GDP to collapse when what it needed to have was a looser policy. And, and here I want to be very clear because I've been misunderstood in my writings on this in, in many ways, but I'm only right. just touching on the one I'm thing. I'm aware of them. <laughs> the ultimate problem was overly tight monetary policy policy and a desire to maintain effectively a federal funds target that was too high and later a target range that was too high. The instruments by which this overly tight policy was implemented included sterilization and then interest on reserves. So, so, you're, so in a sense, there's nothing wrong with sterilization and there's nothing wrong with paying interest on reserves. What is wrong is doing those things in the context in which they were done or starting to do them in the mm -hmm. way they were done when uh, they amounted to means for keeping monetary policy excessively tight. That's the sense in which I'm criticizing these things. I have nothing against, well, I better be careful. I, I, in principle, a sterilization can be just the right thing to do under the right circumstances. Similarly, paying interest on reserves, especially required reserves, but perhaps even excess reserves. And yes, we all know about the efficiency arguments for that, the Friedman rule and so on, which were the basis for the original legislation giving the Fed this power, but not had nothing to do with the decision to implement this rule at the time. Now, there's something else. You're probably going to ask me about this anyway, but I've been hammered on 25 basis points, how much difference can that make? And, and, uh, and I've been hammered by too many uh, very, very knowledgeable people to uh, by any means wish to deny that they, they have a point. Uh, however, I have to be very careful what I, uh, I hope that I'm not I, – I want to be very careful I'm not misinterpreted here. I don't believe 25 basis points in equilibrium – make much difference, certainly to, not to risky bank lending and certainly not if capital is constrained. The reason bank lending is, is so low is because of regulation and capital requirements and all sorts of things have nothing to do with those 25 basis points. What I think that 25 basis points did was to implement an overly tight policy, uh, particularly by, by restraining – 
the money multiplier that resulted in banks holding excess reserves and accumulating them instead of using them to buy treasuries, which would have given effect to the multiplier. And, um, and, uh, and I think 25 basis points uh, definitely could have this effect even though it was a small amount because what matters isn't the absolute number of basis points you're talking about but whether whatever is being done in the way of paying interest and reserves, whatever change there is in that policy results in having reserves bear a greater yield or return than uh, many of the alternative liquid assets, specifically treasury securities that, that are out there. When that happens – and that can happen because of a three basis point change in interest on reserves in mm -hmm. principle. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a real shift in the circumstances that can affect uh, the total uh, equilibrium. Now, the equilibrium, the real change here is in the nominal total money supply growth that comes out of any Fed expansion being a much lower number and a lower equilibrium price level or than would have resulted otherwise. In again, and here's another misunderstanding. In the long run, the real outcomes would be the same. Very, I mean, there would be very little real effect of 25 basis points. But since we're talking about monetary effects, then in the short run, those can have a very big influence. Specifically, it can mean the difference between the Fed easing money enough to help us stop this collapse of NGDP or then get it back up again, or it's not doing so for given what it's doing with the rest of its balance sheet. That's the argument. Yes. And, and I, there's a pattern there. I mean, I think you're pointing out there's a pattern, a consistency in their actions. Sterilized lending, <clears throat> it, it kept nominal spending growth down. Um, it kept inflation reined in. They are very concerned about keeping a low inflation uh, target being met. They were very worried in uh, this period when they implemented interest in reserves and before – they, they were worried about uh, inflation. Right. So sterilized and the lending. the hawks were putting a lot of pressure right. on the Fed not to ease policy. And there's so a whole other not, podcast is, there about the political economy. This is not banking. just about Bernanke, but in this case, right. the hawks really had it wrong. But you have sterilized lending. The same spirit flows into the interest on reserves. And I would argue it also flows into the QE programs. Mm -hmm. The QE programs have been very clearly set up from the get-go. It's been signaled by Fed officials, including Bernanke and Yellen. Uh, there's Fed reports that those are ultimately temporary in nature, that the, the balance sheet will eventually, you know, be brought down to a pre-crisis uh, size. And if, if, if that does happen, and maybe something may prevent that from happening, but if that does happen, it, it follows a pattern here. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, I wouldn't want the balance sheet to become permanent at the size it is, but the reason they had to go so because they're tinkering on the margins, they're playing with interest spreads. It, the whole spirit of they're trying to sterilize everything they do and and try to tweak the credit markets, try to tweak spreads, as opposed to you know, trying to get some nominal spending growth. Right. And see, but this is an, an area where I want to speak about my differences with market monitors because they're, they're important differences on, on okay. QE. Uh, QE, of course, as I said, was quite inadvertent. It, there was no signs or anything behind it. Uh, they found the, – the Fed literally resorted to QE because it, it no longer couldn't, right? In other words, it, it found it – It had to, treasuries. It had, uh, had to expand its balance sheet. Yes. And then, of course, it was not – it was also not able to keep the federal funds rate uh, from actually – effectively uh, falling to zero or that so it eventually had uh, to mm -hmm. concede that it, its target might as well be zero so we're in a zero lower bound world and so the usual monetary targeting is is off the table uh, this was something that the QE is something the Fed completely stumbled into it didn't it didn't go at it with a good well-formed theory Dan Thorne has a very nice Cato policy analysis talking all about this uh -huh. uh, it was it was uh, it, it was not a well conceived or thought out policy at all. Afterwards, they tried to rationalize it in all sorts of ways. Now, here's my criticism of the mon market monetarists. Precisely because the, the, the Fed had uh, taken these other steps, uh, particularly interest on reserves, that cut, cut the multiplier out, right? What that meant was for any given amount of, 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 of balance sheet growth at the Fed, the, the payoff in terms of mon money growth and NGDP growth was – was very muted. Uh, every, no, I, I think we would agree I mean, this with is, that. Everybody yes. can see that yes. what's happening is excess reserves pile up. Yes, and that's that. Um, now, 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 there was some growth, of course. It did help because you have one to one. You have one to one or something right. like that, or growth of money supply. Uh, but 
But the cost, and this is the political economy argument, right? When the only way you can get a not very impressive improvement in GDP uh -huh. is by adding trillions of dollars to the Fed balance sheet, that's very costly because uh, it creates exit problems. It creates income distribution issues. It creates all kinds of problems with particular asset markets because of the quantities of these assets being you know, boost, uh, purchased. They're, they're tremendous costs. Uh, and I'm not sure it was worth it. And so uh, my position is that uh, I, I commend all the market monitors to the extent they were attacking interest on reserves. And I commend them for, you know, uh, uh, arguing in favor of policies that would have re restored in GDP uh, in its level mm -hmm. and growth rate. Uh, however, I think it, I would have personally, my own view was uh, that the Fed was irresponsible to try to uh, uh, do these things while at the same time having taken steps that, that killed the money multiplier. And I, I mean, I, I prepared, to, I'm still prepared to be told I was wrong. The multiplier would have been dead anyway, but I'm not yet convinced. I'm certainly not convinced that that was the case in 2008 when, when this all really mattered. I think that timing was, was pivotal in, yeah. in turning, a, these, those or, in, three turning months, an ordinary recession into a great recession. I believe what happened between October and uh, December 2008 is what really deserves yeah. the most scrutiny here. That was the turning point. Well, on that sobering note, we're out of time, How about but that? it's been a joy, George, uh, talking to you and I always learn something new. Our guest today has been George Selgin of the Cato Institute. George, thank you for being on the show. You're very welcome, David. Thanks for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.